On July 14, 2000, X-Men debuted in American theaters. Directed by Brian Singer with a screenplay by David Hayter, the movie helped to launch the era of the modern superhero blockbuster, coming two years before Sam Raimi's Spider-Man and a full eight years before Iron Man kicked off the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Also, holy crap, Iron Man was in 2008. It somehow feels like it was a lot longer ago. Produced by 20th Century Fox, X-Men and its sequels and spin-offs existed as a series completely different from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, even though it drew from the same source material. This separate franchise lasted 20 years and 13 films, culminating with 2020's The New Mutants, before Fox was purchased by Disney, folding the rights to the X-Men characters back into the Marvel stable. And while many people are waiting with bated breath for Marvel to announce how Hugh Jackman will land in the middle of their already-in-progress story, I beg Disney to give everybody what they really want. Bruce Campbell as Wolverine. God bless. That was the, like the biggest waste of digital ever. I said all of that to come back around and tell you that our topic today has little to nothing to do with the X-Men franchise, except that an idea that started off as a goofy parody almost managed to beat the X-Men to the punch. This is the story of the X-Mutants, the little intellectual property that didn't. The 1980s was a boom era for independently published black and white comics. Whenever people talk about this moment in publishing history, they like to throw out the names of Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird, whose indie creation Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles spawned a mainstream media juggernaut that continues to this day. But the black and white revolution was long in the making. Despite debuting in 1984, the Turtles didn't really make their kid-friendly splash until 1987, and before that happened, the fresh direct sales market for comics had already birthed ElfQuest, Cerebus the Aardvark, A Distant Soil, and John Sable Freelance. An audience that had grown up with comics was starving for more mature stories in the medium, and the indie imprints were free from the control of the Comics Code Authority that had kept comics at a level of PG or lower for decades. The Turtles would ultimately be the spark that would lead to an indie comics speculation boom and bust. But for a brief moment in time, it felt like having your own black and white comic was a license to print money. So it was that in 1986, New imprint Eternity Comics, a subsidiary of Malibu, printed the first ever issue of X Mutants. Created by David Lawrence and Ron Lim with editor David Campiti, the story was a post apocalyptic adventure in which the mutated Dr. Emmanuel Cugat rescues five other mutants and resequences their DNA to turn them back into human beings. Not just human beings, but physically perfect human beings at that. The original five were named Belushi, Aaron, Angela, Vicky, and Lorelai, and they were sent out into the world to inspire the other mutants of the Shattered Earth, who, it turns out, weren't all that keen to be inspired. It bore little connection to Marvel's titles, except for the cheeky play on words of being ex-mutants, people who were mutated, but aren't anymore. Writer David Lawrence described the series as a light-hearted post-nuclear adventure series. The series jumped publishers for issue number two, which featured an editorial offering no other explanation than that it made more sense all around to seek other backers. The series continued as an amazing comics title for four more issues, then finished out its run with Pied Piper comics. 
Along the way, it spun off The New Humans, with a name inspired by Marvel's The New Mutants, and introduced future spin-off subjects, The Wild Knights. But the light-hearted post-nuclear adventure came to an abrupt halt with issue number eight. Don't let the Marx Brothers pastiche on the cover fool you. This issue, titled If This Be Madness, is a very dark ride. The writing credits are split with creator and writer David Lawrence taking credit for the first five pages, editor David Campidi taking credit for the next 15, and the last five written by Frank Miller's collaborator on Daredevil and Pied Piper Comics editor-in-chief Roger McKenzie. The first five pages set up a fairly standard rescue story, picking up from the previous issue when the X-Mutants were captured by gang leader Frog. Then with page six, we plunge into Dr. Kugit's laboratory, where we find the good mutant doctor telling Norma Jean, a duplicate of Marilyn Monroe, all about his troubled childhood before declaring that he believes the X-Mutants may have been a mistake. Page 20 ends with an idyllic image of Kugit and Norma Jean joined in an embrace as Jean declares her love for Kugit. And then page 21 begins with Dr. Kugit narrating, I murdered her in her sleep. Over the course of the next five pages, Kugit hunts down his creations, captures them, and reverts them to their mutant forms before setting off a nuclear bomb that destroys the city, and that was the end of the X-Mutants. Or rather, it was the end of Lawrence and Lim's X-Mutants. It's hard to know the exact reason that this incarnation of the X-Mutants ended the way it did, but we can make an educated guess. One of the little talked about quirks of 80s and 90s independent comics has to do with ownership. Most artists who drifted to the indie publishers were seeking to control their own creations, and the contracts seemed to promise that, except that while publishers like Malibu offered contracts that let the creators keep their copyrights, they tended to reserve trademarks for themselves. And anyone who has ever even touched intellectual property can tell you that working on a property where the trademark is held by somebody else is a dangerous game, even if you own the copyright. When Lawrence and Lim jumped from Eternity, a Malibu imprint, to Amazing Comics and then to Pied Piper, they found themselves engaged in a lawsuit over whether they truly owned the X-Mutants or if they had assigned all of the essential rights to Eternity. Whatever the contracts might have said, Lawrence and Lim and their publishers did not have pockets as deep as Malibu did. As they were preparing the eighth issue, Lawrence and Lim ran out of money to continue fighting the legal battle, and control of the series was surrendered to Eternity. Speaking to QRD, David Lawrence said that ultimately Eternity declared that he and Lim owned all of the characters and their stories, but that Malibu owned the rights to do their own version. Eternity set to work establishing the X-Mutants as the core of a new shared universe. The Wild Knights got their own series, and Eternity continued with new stories for the new humans as well, all of them under the banner of the Shattered Earth Chronicles. The story launched with a brand new X-Mutants number one that explained the atomic bomb set off by Dr. Kugit had not killed the team, but rather had shifted them into a different dimension. Eternity gambled big on the X-Mutants being the next Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, approving a series of solo stories for each of the characters and using the title as a testing bed for new ideas. They also reprinted the first seven issues of the original series as graphic novel volumes, but opted out of reprinting that bleak final installment. While Eternity took the characters back, Lawrence and Lim did not come with them. On the blog Longbox Graveyard, 
Writer Paul O'Connor doesn't have much to say in terms of memories about working on the 15 issues of the Shattered Earth X-Mutants as their replacement. In fact, he refers to it as grinded out work for hire, although he also mentions that the first issue of his run earned him around six or seven hundred dollars, making it the most he was ever paid to write a comic book. At the 15th issue, the comic once again came to an abrupt halt in a narrated after the war sequence in which it was explained that once the final story arc had finished, the X-Mutants pretty much lost all motivation to be heroes and never returned to the work they had originally set out to do. The final issue was published in 1990 with all of the spin-offs having already ended. For two years, the X-Mutants were off the page without any presence in the newsstands. And when it comes to media, especially independent media, two years is an eternity to be absent. But while the X-Mutants may not have had any adventures going into print, Malibu was working behind the scenes to try to push the X-Mutants into the same sort of licensing success that the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles had seen. Part of that involved pursuing a Hollywood adaptation through multiple drafts of a screenplay, including a hard-hitting R-rated edition that began with shock troopers slaughtering babies in a nursery. Everything's fine, I'm fine, oh, fine, I'm fine. When all was said and done, however, Malibu had managed to shepherd only one adaptation to completion. Released in the second half of 1992, X-Mutants was released for the Sega Genesis by Malibu Interactive, a game studio that was born out of a merger between Malibu and software developers Acme Interactive. The game followed a completely different squad of former mutants through a new take on the Shattered Earth with completely new villains. The change of characters accomplished a lot for the series. It brightened character designs that made the series more attractive, and the villains now had more of a cuddly, comical quality to them. And it can't be denied that changing the main characters and their foes helped out Eternity by eliminating any legal claim that Lawrence and Lim might have had to ownership of the brand. They were not credited in the video game as creators, or as anything else for that matter. And with the release of the game on the horizon, Malibu needed to put their brand back in front of people. It probably helped Malibu's confidence that they had just helped Todd McFarlane and his band of mainstream comics refugees with the founding of Image Comics in the same year. With Image moving quickly to spin off into their own entity free from Malibu, Malibu jumped to replace the titles while they were still riding high off of the association. This involved relaunching some of their older titles, like Dinosaurs for Hire and, of course, the X-Mutants as part of the Genesis line, this time basing their series off of the changed roster and setting of the video game they had been developing. The new team was split 50-50 in terms of gender. Dylan, Ackroyd, Bud, Shannon, Piper, and Tanya had been reverted from mutants into human beings by the cyborg Professor Kildare, who wanted them to fight against mutant slaver and crime boss Sluggo. Not that Sluggo. X-Mutants launched in a new continuity free from the Shattered Earth, written by Tom Mason, Dave Ulbrich, and Chris Ulm, with pencils and cover art by Paul Pelletier. Pelletier's crisp, clear artwork, with inks by Ken Branch, helped Malibu make the transition from black and white to color, and that may have ultimately led to the series' downfall. God bless, that was a, like the <laughs> biggest waste of digital ever. Maybe you've seen people talk about how the coloring of older comic books looks dated. In fact, when older titles like Miracle Man see modern reprints, it's not unusual for the publisher to recolor them to make them look more modern. And that modern coloring style apparently started with Malibu. First, the Genesis titles, X-Mutants, Protectors, and Dinosaurs for Hire, 
appeared on the scene with more nuanced coloration that reproduced crisply. And then Malibu's in-house superhero line launched as 1994's Ultraverse. Before long, the Ultraverse was actually beginning to compete with Marvel, DC, and Image, and Malibu started to consolidate the Genesis titles into a single entity. And that's when a pre-Disney Marvel decided to take action. They bought Malibu Comics reportedly to acquire their coloring department. In September of 1995, Marvel canceled every title that Malibu published and relaunched the Ultraverse titles, and only the Ultraverse titles, in a crossover event called Black September that collapsed the Ultraverse into the Marvel Universe. Several characters were written out of continuity completely, and over the next year and a half, the Ultraverse characters were gradually phased out of existence. Since that time, no Malibu character has resurfaced from Marvel. Speaking with QRD, David Lawrence was asked who owns the X-Mutants and said, it would take an infinite number of lawyers with an infinite number of typewriters and eventually they'd produce a complete episode of Gilligan's Island. He then went on to speculate that whatever rights Malibu had to the property most likely went to Marvel in the sale. But Marvel itself has echoed Lawrence's own opinion about the difficulty of bringing anything back. Steve Englehart, one of Malibu's Ultraverse creators, said that in 2003, he was brought in to discuss a Malibu relaunch that never happened. And in 2005, Marvel's editor-in-chief Joe Quesada told Newsarama, Let's just say that I wanted to bring these characters back in a very big way, but the way that the deal was initially structured, it's next to impossible to go back and publish these books. And went on to say that, while it was true that royalties would be owed to the creators of the Ultraverse, it's not the reason why we have chosen not to go near these characters. There is a bigger one, but I really don't feel like it's my place to make that dirty laundry public. And that ends the story of the X-Mutants, a mostly forgotten comics team that at one point certainly seemed to be on its way to be the next Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and that now exists in the complex limbo that is the American intellectual property system. Let's face it, Disney has more and better lawyers than God, and if their legal department can't sort it out, it's unlikely any of Malibu's characters will ever see the light of day again. And not to confuse the matter of ownership or motives even further, but Tom Mason, former writer for Eternity and Malibu, posted on ComicsBeat.com back in 2013 that Marvel didn't buy Malibu for their coloring department, but rather that they did it solely to keep the Ultraverse out of the hands of DC Comics, who had already made an offer. He then went on to say that an NDA in place with certain parties was the reason Tom Brevert had told him Marvel couldn't bring back Malibu's properties, before speculating that it had to do with Malibu executive Scott Rosenberg leaving Marvel to found Platinum Studios, but retaining a contract that gives him a producer deal on all Malibu Comics properties Ain't the entertainment industry grand? Thanks for clicking on this video. If you're an old comics shop haunter like me, what do you remember grabbing out of the discount bin? Drop into the comments and let me know. And also let me know if it's still somewhere easy to find or if it's been lost to the dustbin of history as far as you know. I discovered X-Mutants first through their color run at Malibu when I found a near-complete set of issues hanging out in my local comic shop's only a dollar bin. Also, big thanks to our Patreon patrons. If you're in a position financially to help the channel grow, check out the Patreon, coffee, and affiliate links in the description below. And while you're there, click like and subscribe if you haven't already, and share this video with any friends you think might enjoy it. It helps the channel a lot, and after all, sharing is caring. 
Until next time, watch and read like it means something. Thank you.